going to get started in just one minute. We had almost 200 people register, so we're going to give them one more minute to pop on. While we're doing that, I'd love to hear where you all are from. So if you want to find the chat box, I want to make sure you're familiar with it because we're definitely going to be using it all throughout the webinar today. I'd love to hear where you're from. Ohio, Chicago, more Chicago, more Ohio, Athens, Greece, holy moly, love it. Wisconsin, Oakland, California, Yuma, Arizona, love that. Sacramento, St. Louis, people from all over the place. All right, well, we'll go ahead and jump in. My name is Catherine Matthijs. I am the founder and CEO of Civility Partners. We are an HR consulting firm focused on building positive, thriving work environments. We often uh, go into very toxic work environments and turn those around. That's kind of our special superpower. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the, the business and how I got into doing this, and I wanted to introduce you to my team as well. Um, I was the director of human resources for an organization here in San Diego, where I am, and found myself working with someone who I would say was a bully. He was my peer. We were both directors, and he definitely spent a lot of time micromanaging everyone in the office, whether you reported to him or not. He yelled. He made it very clear if he didn't like you versus if he did like you. I felt he was insubordinate to the president a lot. Uh, just a very frustrating individual. And as director of HR, I was getting a lot of the complaints uh, about him, you know, people in my office looking for counseling and guidance. I spent a lot of time in the president's office trying to talk him into addressing this problem. And um, it, it was pretty exhausting. During that time, I started getting my master's degree at San Diego State in communication. And I ended up doing all of my graduate research on the topic of workplace bullying and uh, just really became an expert in that. And um, since graduate school, I started Civility Partners and I've had the pleasure of being cited uh, or appearing in a lot of really cool places as an expert. Um, and so I've taken all that knowledge and turned it into, um, you know, a company that turns around company culture. I would love for you to meet my team, Rebecca Del Secco. She's here on the line. She is the fantastic uh, team member who put all of this together. So thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Sabrina is our keeper. She's our essentially our operations and uh, keeps us in line. Tony Herndon is one of our trainers. She is doing uh, a training right now for one of our clients. She's not here. And Suze is also here. She's our newest member. She is a training facilitator and uh, project manager. So uh, super excited to have her. We have also served a huge array of industries over the years and uh, lots of very cool clients. So we've we've seen a lot over, the, over time. Um, so what I would love to encourage you to do is get involved in the chat. I love to be more interactive. This is not a webinar where you just sit and wait while I talk. I would love for you to talk to me, ask questions, challenge me, offer best practices. Uh, you can chat to everyone, or if you want to just chat to me so that no one else sees it, that's fine too. And then I can kind of answer your question without anybody knowing it was your question. Uh, if you're here to get HR uh, credits for SHRM, uh, that will be the very last slide at the end. All right, so let's go ahead and jump in with all of that information. So I'd love to hear from you. What does collaboration mean to you? Go ahead and type that in the chat. What is collaboration? What does that mean? Because we're going to talk about collaborative performance management. What is collaboration? Any thoughts? Working together as a team. Teamwork working to, together to achieve a goal, working together, lots of working together, bringing ideas together, listening, intentional partnering. I like that. Um, thoughts and ideas together as a, as a team. Perfect. So it seems like we all agree on what collaboration is. What about performance management? What is performance management? I liked intentional partnering too. It's a good one. What is performance management? What does that mean to you? Narrowing performance gaps. 
setting expectations for outcome. What else? Helping employees reach their goals. Supporting the growth and performance of others, setting expectations, development of people. Awesome. Coaching, counseling and mentoring, providing support and feedback, measurable development, helping employees perform at expected standards. Okay, perfect. So what I would love for you to do is consider putting all of that together. And if you think about collaborative performance management, what we're talking about is teamwork in terms of a manager and a subordinate, for example, um, partnering up, intentionally partnering to help an employee reach their own performance goals, their personal goals, and in turn, the organization's goals. So this is a process of really working together. Now, over time, all of us in HR know um, the paradigm has shifted and continues to shift from, you know, evaluation and appraisal into working together and partnering, having more frequent one-on-ones and that sort of thing. Um, but I think we still have a long way to go. And at least I see that in my, um, in my work or in our work. And I'll tell you, um, we have noticed a pattern when we do workforce surveys, which we do a lot of, that if you have a collaborative performance management system that's also comprehensive, so we're talking about everything from um, setting expectations and onboarding to um, ongoing you know, goal meetings about goals to appraisal to discipline to the whole thing, um, that just having that, a, a really good comprehensive collaborative performance management system can save a lot of problems. So when we do workforce surveys, often a lot of what we're seeing, a lot of the problems can be solved by having a better system uh, where everyone is trained on how to do it, how to give feedback, how to receive feedback and all of that. So um, I, I just want you to know how important performance management systems can be to your organization's culture. And we're going to talk about intertwining those two things today, your culture and your performance management system. So just thinking through what you have now, kind of a, a quick audit, um, how are managers facilitating conversations? Do they have tools or any sort of script that they can follow? Are they trained on, are they trained on how to um, have performance conversations? This is another area where we see a lot of problems, where managers are told, and we all sort of inherently know if we get promoted to manager, that part of our role is to manage performance. The missing piece is every client we have ever had does not have a performance management system that includes behavior. So do your managers know they are expected to not only manage performance, but behavior? They know if someone's late or missing deadlines or is rude to a customer, you know, that all falls under performance management. But what about behavior? What if somebody is gossiping or making snarky comments or constantly interrupts during staff meetings? Do your managers know that they're supposed to be managing that behavior as well? And have you given them the tools? So something to think about. That's something we see a glaring gap in. Uh, Mary is asking if you'll get the slide deck, you will get a copy of the recording. And then if there's uh, something specific you'd like to know more about, happy to happy to chat with you about it, Mary. Um, so just some other questions here to, to be thinking about as you sort of audit what you have so far. And as I said, your performance management system is a big thing. It's not just the annual performance review. Uh, it's not those monthly or weekly one-on-ones. It's a whole lot of stuff. It's a whole lot of stuff. Um, have you figured out skills and competencies for each role? Do they have clear job descriptions? Um, you know, are people being evaluated and so on and so forth. So there's a, a lot, a lot to think about. So a good performance management system, a collaborative performance system that's based on your organization's culture or a positive culture uh, is one that motivates and engages employees. It ensures that rewards are distributed fairly. It increases communication, which is a big problem that it, that it solves. You know, people can start to understand what their career map is inside your organization. 
or outside your organization? What happens after I get as far as I can in this organization? What, where could I go from here? Um, it, you know, it increases communication back and forth, giving and receiving feedback. Uh, definitely can drive change um, and provides clear expectations, which is something you all mentioned. And of course, it improves performance and behavior as long as it's addressing behavior as part of the process. And therefore, if your performance management system is focused on behavior as well as performance, then you're going to influence your organization's culture. So culture dictates your organization's performance. So we have to connect our performance management system to our culture. Um, there's a ton of research that employees who feel good at work, and I know I'm not saying anything new that you haven't heard before, but just some of the research I've read along the way um, in a meta analysis of 225 academic studies around employee happiness. Um, what these researchers discovered in that meta analysis is that 31% or that happy employees are 31% more productive, they're 37%. Uh, higher sales, and they're three times as creative than employees who are not happy. So um, giving employees good, solid information about expectations, communicating with them, ensuring that they're happy in their job and their role is going to absolutely reflect on your organization's performance. Um, I love to talk about happiness a little bit more. So definitely the research around happiness shows that uh, the frequency of happy experiences is much more important than the intensity. And in fact, the bigger the intensity, the more likely it is to actually drive down your happiness. So for example, if you buy a new car, seems like a big happy event, but most people then go through a little bit of buyer's remorse. And so it actually drives your happiness down um, or getting married, great big fun event, but it's also very stressful. And if expectations aren't met on the other side of that wedding, it can drive down happiness. So really and truly, one thing that your performance management system should ensure is that managers are having positive conversations with employees regularly, giving them those little happy moments. And it sounds so cliche, but like smiling at an employee when you walk by or saying good morning to them, those are all the little happy moments, those types of interactions that actually drive people happy or drive people to be happy. So you can incorporate happiness into um, your, your performance management system and your culture. Um, I'll give one other example, and then I'm going to switch to kind of the dark side of uh, employees at work. Um, this is from a mentor of mine. She actually came up with the name Civility Partners, uh, and she researches uh, doctors and residents in at UCSD. That's a big place where she researches. Um, and what she did was test this theory around happiness, and she put some some uh, residents um, in different rooms, and in one room there was candy on the tables, and in one room there was not. And uh, she gave them kind of a word problem, some sort of disease that they had to figure out in reading through this situation, and then they could work together in groups to at their table to try to solve, you know, figure out what this disease was. And the room that had the candy on the table, that room actually in general solved the problem faster. And people actually, when they were done, they sort of voluntarily got up and went to start helping others. And in the other room, um, people who solved it first did not get up to help others. And uh, they actually on average took a lot longer to solve it. So I'm not saying you should have jelly beans all around your office because it's going to change the world, but it's just to drive home the point that when employees feel good at work, they do perform better. Um, any thoughts, questions, or comments so far? Any Anything anybody wants to add? <laughs> yes, M&Ms are also good. <laughs> All right. I like to eat um, Reese's Pieces out of the freezer. They're, that's really good. That's one of my faves. All right. On the flip side, there's also a ton of research that uh, people who are unhappy or who are mistreated at work definitely cost the organization something. So for example, Christine Porath is a big researcher in the world of incivility. She's written some books. She often does research and then publishes it in the Harvard Business Review. 
Uh, she found, this is a an, an article you can easily access in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, she found in a survey of 800 people, she asked them about having an uncivil encounter and kind of what happened after that. And this is just some of what she found that people at the receiving end of an uncivil interaction actually intentionally decreased their work effort. 80% of her respondents said that they lost work time. You know, people are wasting time while they try to figure out ways to avoid this person. Um, their commitment to the organization goes down. One other big number, disengaged employees cost upwards of $450 billion per year in lost productivity. So the point is that, again, as we continue to on this trek of changing the paradigm from what performance management was to what it is now and what it could be in the future, um, we really have to consider this as a collaborative process. It's teamwork. It's an opportunity to support employees in growth and support their happiness. Um, employees who don't feel like they're getting information about their growth or how they're doing or whether they're meeting expectations, those are the employees that are unhappy. Those are the employees that cost $450 billion per year. So how can your performance management process support collaboration? What can you be doing? Um, again, performance management is about growth. It's not about the, the performance. It's not about let me attack you because you're not meeting expectations. It's let's talk about your growth. And even if the conversation has to be around you're not meeting expectations, the point of that conversation is to get that person to grow. So we really have to continue to help managers see this as a good thing. Um, the old way, you know, the kind of non-collaborative top-down sort of feedback, you know, it was like a one-time annual event. It was about things you needed to correct. It was about the manager's point of view in terms of your performance. Um, it was about what happened in the past over the last year, right? And these days in moving more towards collaboration, um, this is an ongoing process. You might be having weekly or your managers might be having weekly meetings uh, with others. Your managers can be thinking about the future for this employee as opposed to what happened in the past. And it's about setting baby steps to help people get to where they're trying to go. So here's the process that we always operate on. So we, we definitely have created many performance management systems for our clients. Again, when we do our workforce surveys, that is all, often a very glaring, easy problem um, that, hey, it, you can fix a lot of these problems just by having a better performance management system. Um, so the, the thing is that the manager does set clear expectations about behavior and performance. So behavior too. Um, and then together, the manager and employee co-create that plan. They partner to implement that plan, which means the employee is obviously going off to implement it, but the uh, manager is there supporting, making sure that person has what they need. Uh, there's obviously a whole lot of feedback, and that's both ways. The employee needs to be able to feel comfortable to say, hey, manager, I know we had this plan in place, but I'm not able to achieve it because I don't have the time or the resources or I have too much work and I'm not able to prioritize that. How can we work through that? So the feedback isn't just you're not meeting the plan. It's talking about what's working, what's not working. How can we make sure you're getting what you need? Um, and so through those feedback conversations, then the manager can be helping the employee figure out what kind of training or coaching or resources do they need? More feedback, and then you go back to what's the next plan, next step. Um, and of course, if the employee is not making any positive changes, then of course you may go down a disciplinary path. Um, so when you're thinking about this collaborative process, I'm talking about weekly informal check-ins. I'm talking about quarterly meetups at the very least that are more formal. So, you know, feedback can come both informal and formal, of course, uh, maybe doing 360 degree feedback so that uh, employees are getting information about how they're perceived from all directions. And so are managers and so are leaders. Um, so that's another common thing we see among our clients who come to us with some kind of toxic issues is that the leaders and the managers are not getting enough feedback about them and they need to be getting feedback about them. Um, some other, one other kind of cool thing to maybe think about doing is peer feedback once a project is over. 
So let's say you work through a client or a team works through a client. Once it's over, then the team members can kind of rate each other on whether or not they would want to work with that person again on a project and why or why not. So getting feedback often needs to be a part of your culture. So of course, managers and leaders need to play a big role in this. And I'm actually gonna pause here and just see any thoughts, comments, questions. The last time I did this webinar, my chat was exploding. So I, I just wanna make sure I'm getting you what you need. Thoughts, questions, comments, any best practices anybody wants to add? I'm gonna give you a minute. Ooh, in performance management, could scheduling social time or team building be helpful? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, if if collaborative performance management about is about um, intentional partnership, I love that, um, that obviously the partnerships, you need to have opportunity to grow and thrive. So doing things like team building or social time absolutely is important. Oh, well, thanks. Crystal says I'm, she's shifting her thinking. What about employee self-evaluations? I'm gonna answer this and then I'm curious, uh, I would love to hear others. So the question is from Deborah, what about what about employee self-evaluations? What are our thoughts on that? I'm curious to hear from others in the audience. Um, I think, uh, so we, we include self-evaluations when we're putting um, performance management systems together for our clients. Um, and I think they're important if, for example, uh, one, you know, what we've done in the past is whatever that performance management sort of form looks like, that the employee fills it out themselves and then the, the manager also fills it out. And then when they have their meeting um, to talk through it, they're able to see if they're aligned or not. And obviously there's gonna be a little bit of misalignment, uh, which is to be expected. But if there's a lot of misalignment, then, that really highlights that that's happening and um, you know, some gives you an opportunity to address that. So um, even with those, you know, if you're doing, for example, former, formal quarterly meet it, meetups where you're going through performance, even having some sort of you know, form that's light, that couple questions on it for both sides to fill out, it just helps make sure that everybody agrees, you know, here's where this employee is at and here's the resources they might need. So those are my thoughts. Um, focusing on performance more than annually helps, yes. Okay, let's see. How do you accommodate those who have grown up in a non-collaborative environment, typically baby boomers and those that are seeking one, uh, typically the new generation? Okay, so you have baby boomers who have grown up in, some, in an environment that's not collaborative, it's more hierarchical. And then you've got the newer generations that are really looking for collaboration. So this goes back to your culture, right? And your performance system can drive culture and culture is going to drive your performance system. So if, for example, um, you know, some version of teamwork, collaboration, whatever it is, respect is in your core values, then you can lean on that as a way to say, this is this is our core value and you know we want to make sure that people are having these types of conversations um so i i would say a big piece of that is really helping the baby boomers have a paradigm shift because they did grow up i mean even i i've been in hr for 25 years and the amount of shifting that's happened in in hr is incredible i can't imagine having been in HR for 30 or 40 years or being a baby boomer. So um, it's about having those conversations and it's about coaching those managers. So if you have a, a manager who's having a hard time, you know, having or building a collaborative culture through performance management conversations, then that person needs to have some ongoing coaching about how to do it and why to do it. Let's see. When compared to the manager's PM, is there a disconnect or not? Deborah, can you elaborate? Are you asking me or you're saying, um, 
elaborate for me. Uh, some people use self-evals to remind management of things. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I'm a fan of self-evaluations for sure. Um, what are your recommendations on employees evaluating supervisors and coworkers in confidence? Um, here's what I think. I think if you're doing, you know, you're kind of doing a 360, or that's kind of what you're asking about. I am not a fan of the 360 programs where everybody measures each other and you're rating them on a scale. And then what I guess what I often hear that happens is that then the employee is given this report and it's like, oh, my coworkers rated me a seven out of 10. And here's a couple comments. But what do I do with that? So um, we are big fans of qualitative research here. So while our workforce surveys, um, you know, we're, we did, we call them climate assessments. So we're measuring a lot of different things like employee engagement, job satisfaction, trust and leadership. Um, those benchmarks are nice um, because then you can see, hey, this moved from 20% of people feeling a certain way to 50%, you know, so it's a great way to track. But that qualitative data is where the real information is about why people rated things a certain way. So that's my very long-winded answer to say, I am a fan of evaluating supervisors and coworkers and confidence. I'm not a fan of going and getting a, you know, a 360 review application or software that doesn't really give people a lot of useful information. So um, I know, for example, we've helped implement Bamboo HR. Um, they have a place where peers uh, can type in some things. So if there's kind of an anonymous way for people to provide the qualitative data, that's good. Um, but again, it, you know, it some of the problems that arise from that are, hey, I hate that coworker. I do not like that person. And they tick me off all the time. So I'm going to give them a horrible review, even though maybe they're good at their job. So you kind of have to take it a bit with a grain of salt. Um, and that's where looking for themes is very important. So that's something that makes us different when we do these types of things. Uh, we take that qualitative data and we move it into themes so that an employee could maybe get back something that says, hey, you know, you were reviewed by five people and there was a theme among those five people that you can be snippy or that you've missed quite a few deadlines versus one person saying that's the way you are. So hopefully my long winded answer was helpful. Um, oh, my team is reminding me too, <laughs> the climate assessments are a great way to hold managers accountable for, for their performance and their behavior, right? So when we do workforce surveys, um, you know, we can divvy it up by department and, and have our statistical analysis done that way. So we could say, hey, the sales department has pretty low scores versus the marketing department has really high scores. What's going on with the leaders of each of those departments that one department's doing really well and they're happy and one's not? So um, climate assessments are a great way to hold managers accountable for their role in your company culture. Okay, let's see. These are some great questions. I'm glad I paused to ask. Do, do is, is a large misalignment of employee performance evaluations versus manager performance evaluations an indication of unclear expectations or job responsibilities? It absolutely could be. Great question. Um, so in that situation, sometimes it can be, or a lot of times it can be easy for a manager to say, well, you're not performing. Um, but unless it, th this manager has done everything they can to make sure that an employee has all of the resources and the training that they need, um, then that's not a fair assessment, right? So hopefully if you're doing manager training on performance management um, and giving your managers tools, that's some of the things you're talking about is that if you're the leader and somebody's not performing, the first thing you have to do is ask yourself what you're doing as the manager or not doing and does that person have everything they need? So um, it, it absolutely could be an indication of that. Let's see, what would you recommend as a good strategy to coach managers into using performance management in an environment where evaluations didn't exist? That's a great question. And we've definitely had clients where it was like, no feedback was the culture. We have a culture of non-feedback. And if you give the managers feedback, they're gonna be defensive. 
Um, and so, um, yeah, so I would say that this is like any culture change, and we'll talk more about this as we go. Like any culture change, it's you're asking people to change their behavior, right? So it means that leadership has to come out and say, hey, everyone, we've decided based on these reasons, could be a, a climate assessment from civility partners, that uh, we're recognizing that not having ongoing performance conversations is actually one of the reasons people are unhappy or we've seen some turnover. And so we really need to address that. So I'll tell you a big piece of change is to first sell the problem and then sell the solution. So instead of going to those managers to say, hey, you need to start using performance management, you gotta focus on, look at all these problems that we have and a really great comprehensive solution that would address those problems is a better performance management system. Um, and then from there, like any culture change, you start to influence things over time. So I would not just come down and say, here's our big giant comprehensive performance management system. Everybody better get on board. Instead, it's little by little. So then you might start with, hey, we're going to do a, a quarterly meeting. That quarterly meeting needs to occur with your employees over the month of October, you know, so you have from October 1 to October 31 to dip your toes in the water and start this process of having a performance management conversation. We're going to give you some training before we do that so that you have an idea on what's supposed to happen in that conversation. Um, you may even train the employees, hey, we're impl implementing this. Here's what we think needs to happen in that conversation. Um, so you, what you're talking about is culture change, and uh, it's a, a long ongoing process. What is my opinion about the sandwich approach? I hate the sandwich approach. I'm not a fan. Um, it's the, you know, it kind of takes away. It's like, you're doing really great, but also this thing stinks. And also you're really great. Um, so I'm not personally a fan, but actually the answer to your question, Amy, is that you need to ask your employees, how do they want to have feedback? So if we're building a respectful, positive culture, empathy plays a role in that. And so you need to talk to your employees about how they want feedback. All right, these are some great questions. Keep them coming. Okay, so managers and leadership uh, definitely needs to be focused on changing their own behavior, right? From um, giving performance feedback that says you need to fix these things uh, into being more of a coach and a collaborator, which means do give positive feedback for me personally, not in the sandwich scenario. Um, but look, if you're giving feedback constantly, um, then most of it's probably going to be positive, right? So going back to my thoughts about happiness or my the research I talked about, um, if somebody is hearing at least once a day or every other day or once a week, thank you for your hard work on that project, or gosh, you're really good at X, um, that that's what that's what, that's what needs to happen. And that's what managers need to be trained in doing. And that way, when you have that moment where they made a boo-boo, it's like you made a boo-boo, but also they've heard all of the positive feedback that the manager has been giving over time. And actually that goes back to the sandwich approach too. You shouldn't need the sandwich approach if you're giving ongoing positive feedback. Constructive feedback is important. And this is, you know, managers need some training on how to give constructive feedback. And everyone needs training on how to receive feedback. So we often do a training called giving and receiving feedback um, because getting feedback can be rough on our ego, right? So it's important to get some tools on how to accept that feedback. Um, making sure that mistakes are seen as learning opportunities, right? Um, what's the saying, Einstein, um, you know, made a bunch of mistakes before he figured this, that, and the other thing out. Um, Edison, I think the saying is he failed a thousand times before he invented the light bulb. Um, what if he hadn't done that 1001, you know, so mistakes don't have to be something that people feel embarrassed about. It's, we're all going to make them, nobody's perfect. So again, um, through the tone of your comprehensive system, you can really create this tone of collaboration and positivity. Um, and of course, some kind of basic um, information about using collaborative language. I think this is a slide from our conflict resolution um, training deck as well. You know, the 
using we and let's again this is a partnership it's a collaboration not you need to do this um owning your feelings saying things like i noticed this that and the other thing versus you um so just standard collaborative stuff um and so one of the main things and i mentioned this earlier that we see in our clients who come to us because they have a problem um is that managers have not been getting trained on how to have performance conversations how to give and receive feedback um, and they haven't been given the full scope of what their role really is. So managers should be told and trained on how to set expectations, again, for performance and also behavior. And that's where your culture is going to build um, through behavior. Um, they should be trained on how to set goals for their departments and with their teams and how to attach the individual and the departmental goals to the organization's goal. 100%, uh, we, all of our clients who come to us with a, a bit of an issue have not been teaching their managers or even telling their managers that they should be addressing and coaching negative behavior. So again, if somebody is late uh, to work or missing deadlines or rude to a customer, managers inherently know those things that hey i'm supposed to address that stuff but what about the gossip what about the sarcastic remarks managers aren't doing that stuff they get trained on anti-harassment and then they're just kind of keeping their eyes peeled for a harassment claim and then they hear something happened and they freak out because they don't know what to do with it and they wonder if it's harassment and they call hr um, but instead they could be coaching that stuff on an ongoing basis um you know so some typical typical stuff um, the other glaring problem that I see with our clients is that managers are not trained on proactively building a positive work environment. So in addition to everything that was on the other slide, managers need training on how to proactively create, facilitate, and sustain a respectful, positive, and collaborative team dynamic. And managers are, I don't see this training anywhere. As far as I know, we're the only ones who do it. I have never seen training like that and it it boggles my mind so if we want a good culture where people feel respected and get empathy and they feel they can be vulnerable and they feel psychologically safe managers need training on how to do that on an ongoing basis all day every day and then managers need to be held accountable to the behaviors that they learn in those trainings and this is how your collaborative performance management system is going to influence your culture and make you a great place to work. Um, Deborah, do you like SMART goals? Yeah, I like SMART goals for setting employee goals, and I like SMART goals for setting manager goals about their own behavior and performance too. Yep. Okay, um, so let's talk about how you can intertwine your culture and drive performance. So organizational culture, um, you know, it has to bleed through every nook and cranny of your organization. And so your performance management system has to speak to your culture and your culture, you know, can be driven home through the performance management system. So I just want to point out what culture really is. And I have a, a few different ways to unpack this. Um, we've gotten into a place with something like harassment prevention, which is a world that we obviously live in being toxic work environment consultants um, where, you know, hey, like in California, where I live and some of you do, you go to training about not harassing people and what to do if you hear about harassment. And here's the technical definitions. Um, and then there's a policy, an anti-harassment policy. And then we kind of assume that that's going to influence our culture. Or maybe we don't. Maybe we don't even think about how that could influence our culture if we did that training better. I have a whole other thoughts about our harassment prevention training. Um, but training and policy don't influence your culture. Um, so what you have to think about instead is leaders. And uh, yes, leaders at the top certainly influence your culture, but so does everyone else. So a leader is anyone who influences others. If you have a receptionist and he or she has a really great attitude and people tend to kind of flock to that person because they have a good personality, that's a leader. And that person can be leaned on 
to influence your culture. Certainly policies have to come into play, but they also have to be followed. Um, and then behavior. So training is one thing that influences behavior, but so do a lot of other things. So if you have, if you're leaning on your leaders from top to bottom, you have policies in place to support uh, your culture and then everybody's being influenced in terms of their behavior in the right ways, then that's how your culture comes to be and lives. So um, just to talk about tying performance management to your vision and mission and values, um, keep in mind that your company vision is where the company is going. You know, what would happen, what, what should the world look like if you finished your your position or finished your, uh, your lot in life, what would the world look like? Um, your mission is how you'll get there. So what are the ways in which the organization behaves or what is it that the organization's doing to reach that vision? And then your core values are about how is everyone supposed to behave so that we and the organization can meet the mission and in turn meet the vision. So I often see core values really misused. They're used in recruiting, they're used uh, in on marketing brochures at vendor expos, um, but they are not actually being used to dictate and drive employee behavior. And that is a big mistake, another glaring hole we see. So if your core values were focused on your employees, like how each individual should behave, that is a makes a world of difference in your culture. So understand that culture is the way organizational members think, act, and understand the world around them. So it's driving performance. If your culture is a good culture, if your culture is about things like teamwork um, and people actually live that and they understand the world at work through this lens of teamwork, that's gonna drive performance. So one way to um, really hold each individual accountable to your core values is to turn them into core competencies. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, we worked with a chili dog restaurant chain. I need some water from my giant cup. Um, and they had a fairly good culture. They, they wanted to tighten it up, make sure that they were continuing to grow in the right way with their culture. Um, and so we came up with four core values. The first one is a kind of an ode to the history of the organization. It was started by you know, great, great grandpa on the beach of New Jersey. And that was his shtick that if you went to his hot dog stand, you got more chili than everybody else. So um, that was just kind of an ode to their history, which also drives culture. Um, and then the other three are don't skip on service quality and fun. So then what we did was turn that into core competencies. So if you want to work there, we're talking about customer service um, with our for our, our second one there, don't skimp on service. So here's what that looks like. So if you can take a core value and then turn it into a competency, now you can hold people accountable to that. So um, competencies are written, are always written in a way where it's like, if I observe somebody doing those things, that's how I know they're doing that competency or they're, they're um, meeting the competency or they have that competency. So you know, a manager could say, I observe employee A doing these things, and therefore I can say that that employee is engaged in that core value slash competency. Um, quality work is, you know, a, another one. And then fun is my favorite. And you might be asking, how do you hold people accountable to fun? And you can, you for sure can. So um, if somebody just kind of gives off the fun vibe <laughs> through, and that can be measured through their mood. Are they generally happy? Of course, everyone's going to have a bad day. Um, but if they're generally in a good mood and enjoying others and engaged in conversation, then that's how we're defining fun there at that um, hot dog chain. Um, here was another example of a competency we did for a PR firm that was one of our clients for, gosh, five years or something like that. Um, and so you know, we, what, so one thing we did with this particular client was every, and we, we do this more often than not, um, all of the job descriptions vary a little bit so that, uh, or the, the competencies vary a little bit. So a manager's competencies are going to be different than, 
and employees' competencies. And then their performance management system also reflects that so that it's not one universal performance management sort of form or list of things you're going through. Um, it varies depending on the job. Um, so just wanted to, that's another way to, to go about it. Um, so just some notes on core competencies. Um, they should definitely be unique to each position. So, um, you know, we often create maybe 15 or 20 core competencies and then, you know, plug and play where they belong. Not everybody's held accountable to all 20. Um, you know, somebody might be held accountable to 10. Someone else might be held accountable to a different 10. Um, definitely have your employees involved in finalizing your competencies. Um, and everybody needs to be held accountable to them. So we also see toxic work environments where, for example, um, the executive VP is a bully and everybody despises that person and nobody wants to interact with that person. And that person is allowed to act that way because they're a good performer, they're a rainmaker, um, or they have a lot of organizational knowledge. But that doesn't work. How can you give people anti-harassment training, for example, and then let this person over here be an equal opportunity harasser? Or how can you say these are our core values if you're allowing someone to act, out, act outside of those core values? Um, so everyone needs to be held accountable. So some last couple tips here. Um, definitely, again, talking to your employees about how they want to be rewarded is, is the best uh, way to go about rewarding them. Not everybody wants um, a big bonus. Some people are working towards something specific and they'd rather have, you know, maybe somebody's trying to pay off their college loans and they'd rather have a big chunk, you know, to pay that off versus somebody else who's working for a car. That looks different. Um, so you definitely want to ask your employees. So, uh, you know, ask them and you can ask them in their performance management conversations. How would you like to be recognized? What would make you feel good? Um, give you an example. Um, when I worked at the organization where that bully was, one of the things that that boss did was, uh, and I appreciated this, um, if he had asked me if I wanted it, I probably wouldn't have thought of it, but when he did it, it was cool. So he was a car guy. He loved cars and had some nice cars. Um, and so he had a car wash person come you know, to the office and wash his car probably once a month, if not more. And so then he would sometimes just pop his head in and be like, hey, if you pull your car around back, I'll have it washed for you. And um, he kind of did it at random, but if you got picked and sometimes it was two or three people, then you knew he'd been paying attention to you. You had done something that he had appreciated. Um, so that I did feel appreciated because you kind of knew you were special if you got chosen. Um, so that's an example of kind of different, a variety of ways. Um, and, and rewarding people for performance and behavior doesn't have to be expensive, even posting comments on social media, um, talking about somebody's good work at a staff meeting. Um, one of my favorites, cheapest versions is you can buy butcher paper at Ikea for $4 and you can just tape it to the wall and let people walk by and thank each other, um, or buy chalkboard paint or whiteboard paint. Um, so it's, there, there's a lot of simple simple ways to make people feel good. Um, so I'd love to hear, do you have any other questions, thoughts, comments? You had a good, we had a good lot of questions there. Well, thanks, Jamie. All right. So kind of the last few tips here is making sure that you're communicating often, um, implementing a, a more comprehensive uh, culture building type of a performance management system is definitely one step in a variety of many um, focused on culture change. And you really can use your performance management system to make culture change. And you can hold people accountable to behavior to you know, if somebody's engaging in poor behavior, if your culture is tied into your performance management system, it makes it um, it makes it easier to hold people accountable. So, um, I think managers and HR too, we get caught up in uh, well, that behavior wasn't illegal. I don't really know what to do about it. But if you have a core value that's 
people are being measured on related to good behavior and teamwork and collaboration, then you can hold people accountable to it. It gives managers a tool to say, hey, this behavior isn't acceptable. It goes against our core values. Let me see. What do you do for employees that might feel excluded if they are not chosen for special rewards? That's a great question. Um, I would say that you definitely, if you're going to do rewards at random, you probably need to keep a tally of who's getting rewards when and how often um, so that one person isn't doesn't seem to always be the one who is getting it. Um, and then also as the manager, if you're doing something like that, um, thinking about, well, why is it that Frank never gets that? Why, why am I never choosing Frank for that special reward? And how does that reflect on me if I feel like he, he's not performing and therefore not getting accolades from me? So it ties back to, uh, to that, to leaders thinking about themselves, but um, definitely keeping, um, you know, track. Uh, do you find the behavior conversation is more subjective to certain staff? Ooh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, here's the thing. HR and managers get really caught up in facts and we're trained to do that, right? Because we know, for example, with harassment, there has to be an investigation or when you're, when you're terminating an employee, um, an employee's employment, um, you have to have all the facts and data and, and, you know, HR kind of lives in this world of having to make a case for things that the organization does. So we live in a world of facts. What happens when somebody says, I don't do that. I, that didn't happen. That's not the story. You know, what you can lean on instead of trying to engage in a fact battle is the perception. So for example, um, if you were to say, I'm just thinking of one manager in particular that we worked with that was super defensive. Everything was like, nah, nah, we already tried that, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so she was just defensive. That was the world she lived in. And so imagine trying to talk to her about it. Um, but if you could sit down with that manager and say, I've spoken to a variety of people in your department who you lead, and there is a perception that you're defensive. And of course, she's going to say, no, I'm not because she's defensive. And, and then, or give me some examples. Who said that? You know, that's the, the reaction. And your answer is, look, I don't know. I, I've heard examples when people come to me to talk to me about it. You know, yes, they give examples, but I'm not here to engage in a fact battle with you because I wasn't there. But I'm telling you that I've heard a few times that you're perceived as defensive. And that perception needs to change because it's harming your ability to be a good manager. So we we want to support your growth and help you figure out how to maneuver that. Um, so that's my answer um, because yes, behavior is subjective, but if you can say, and, and this is how I coach leaders who engage in bullying, which is one of the things we do, um, where HR has been telling them, you know, you're too aggressive, you're too abrasive. And of course they're saying, no, I'm not, or my employees need to be kicked in the butt to get things done. Um, and what I do is come in and do a 360 review. And then I bring that feedback to them, you know, so it's not, hey, HR thinks you need to change. It's I interviewed 15 people. And the general consensus is that you shame people in public. Um, the general consensus is this theme, you know, so it's, um, the, operate in perceptions. It's okay to do that. You don't always have to operate in, um, in facts. Let me see. We are in the process of doing the first annual review for our core managers in years. Oh goodness. Would this be a good time to discuss starting ongoing performance management and set the dates timelines as a part of completing this review? Yes, absolutely. And uh, Sean, like I said, we implement performance management systems as part of our culture change work often. So please do feel free to reach out. We'd be happy to brainstorm with you and kind of help you um, get a, a plan in place for that conversation. I'm happy to happy to do that if you'd like to reach out. Let's see. Do you do any work with data on incentive plans or comp structures and their impact? on culture. Um, you know, Amy, we don't, um, but I certainly can refer you to people. So so uh, people doing compensation structures, that is a very specific niche um, that involves a lot of law and regulatory 
stuff. Um, so I'm happy to refer you to someone if you want to reach out to me as well. Okay. Do do good. Then add DEI and it gets muddled further. I'd love to hear more about that, Mary. Um, and while we're doing that, I just want to offer a, a tool for you. So if you want to email us at info at civilitypartners.com, Sean and Amy, definitely email me for your two questions. Everyone else, definitely email us and we'll send you this resource. You're free to pass it around to your organization. Um, Sean, you can use it in that uh, training if you like. I'm going to go ahead and um, Rebecca, it looks like you need to launch the poll for me if you could. We had a poll for you, but it says my polling capabilities are inactive. We might have had a little, I'll, I'll give you a minute to fix that. Um, and we may not be able to. We were just going to ask if you wanted more information from us. So <laughs> if you do, oh, poll came through. Oh, perfect. I can't see it, but okay. Rebecca, take it away. Make it happen. Let me know when it's done. Let me see. Mary, the subjective nature of aggression and some connections to gender, for example. Yes. So. For example, um, I have coached absolutely, uh, just to use DEI as a, a big glaring example, um, I coached a woman who was perceived as a bully uh, or too aggressive. One of her themes that we found in the data when we did the qualitative interviews was that um, she would weaponize race and everybody used that phrase. So it sounded like it was kind of the gossip that people were all using this phrase. Um, she was from India and she would blatantly, for one example we heard about was um, she had asked for an executive assistant. She was a uh, very high level in a very large global nonprofit. Um, she was asking for an assistant and the had kind of submitted her request to the director and the director said no. And in front of everyone, she said, your answer would be different if I was white. Um, and so we had to have a conversation about that theme. Now, it wasn't just that. She also did things like she was super unorganized and then she'd get angry at people if they, you know, didn't produce work. And it's like, you're unorganized. You gave me five different due dates. So there was lots of other things too, but then we could, we had a conver many conversations about how she should say things like that in a different way. Yes, if you feel like you want to call out something, um, there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Because if you do it in public the way that you did it, then your CEO is not, or your director is not listening. But if you were to pull him aside and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and point out that that's how you were feeling, that's a, maybe a better way to educate. Um, so yes, we do see that a lot. All right. So um, for those of you who are looking for SHRM credit, here's the activity name and the ID. I'll give you a second to take a snapshot of the screen. Um, and uh, happy to answer any additional questions or, you know, definitely shoot us an email at info at civilitypartners.com. We'll send you that resource. Uh, always happy to talk, brainstorm, um, do some work. We, we love this stuff. This is what we live and breathe. So um, with that, I will call it a day. Thank you, Ali. I appreciate that. Our contact information is here. And uh, See you on the next one. Don't forget we have two more. And those of you in California, we have a free anti-harassment training for your employees. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Go ahead and uh, click on that link if you wanna register for the next two. Thanks all.